If you want the latest and top stories, go to sarahcarter.com. That's sarahcarter.com. You can also check out the podcast page, and I'd like you to download The Sarah Carter Show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Look, folks, today I will be joined by former Missouri Governor Eric Greitens, who is now running for the U.S. Senate. We will discuss all of the challenges at home and abroad and how our efforts to solve them would look differently with Republicans in the majority in Congress. Because I think that's where we need to go. We've already seen what happened with the Democrats, right? We're seeing that right now. We'll also talk about the soaring cost of fuel. Gosh, have you seen how high it is in California and other parts of the country? I mean, it's crazy. When I was in California, I filled up the tank on my rental car. It was like literally six bucks a gallon. And now I hear it's up to seven, maybe past seven, maybe eight dollars. They're plan- I mean, it's just this is insane prices. Inflation. We're going to talk about that and how Joe Biden is refusing to do the things that would actually help bring those costs down. I've been tweeting about that all day, all night, the whole time since the crisis in Ukraine has erupted. And obviously, so have a lot of other people, but obviously Biden is not listening to any of them. He has other plans. So does the Biden administration. What do they really want? What do they really want? We're going to talk about that. Please follow and subscribe. Get all the links at sarahcarter.com. And folks, while you are there, sign up for our email list. That way you do not get shadow banned. That's what we don't want. We don't want you to be shadow banned. We want to be able to stay in communication with you. But before I get to Eric Greitens and our talk on Joe Biden and what's happening with our nation and around the world, I want to talk to you about a group that actually will fight for you, and that's AMAC. The Association of Mature American Citizens. I talk about them all the time. They're a sponsor for the show. I absolutely love AMAC. And AMAC welcomes everyone who cares about the future of our great republic. I want you to join and stand against a progressive agenda. If you want to do that, you got to join AMAC. There is strength in numbers, folks. And together we can bring one clear, resounding message to the swamp in Washington, D.C. We could do that with AMAC because why? AMAC believes in fighting the good fight against reckless government spending, helping small business owners and helping small businesses prosper, securing our borders, supporting our military veterans like my husband. Look, by joining AMAC, you're taking the first steps to saving the America you love. AMAC offers an alternative to just about every benefit that that other group offers, but without the liberal agenda. I stand with AMAC, and I hope that you will too. I encourage you to join today at amac.us slash carter. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S slash Carter. The benefits of membership are great, but guess what? The cause is even greater. Join today at AMAC dot U-S slash Carter. So let's just start out with what's happening in our world. We're already, I think, like all of you, I'm concerned about the future of our nation. I'm concerned about the safety and health of my children. And I mean, the safety and health of our planet. We've seen what's happening in Europe. We haven't seen an escalation like this, uh, what we're seeing with Russia into Ukraine. We haven't seen this since World War II. This is probably the most dangerous time in our history right now, in modern history. So this weekend, I had to just take a break. I had to take a break from everything and go with my family. Um, We went to the Natural Caverns out here in Texas. And we went hiking in these beautiful caverns underground with these just incredible rock formations. It was stunning. And my, I, I locked out the rest of the world. I just focused on my daughter. I focused on my husband. I focused on things that we need to take care of at the house. Because what's happening in the world is actually very frightening. You know, Russia putting its nuclear apparatus on the ready. And now we know that the nuclear power plant in Ukraine, actually two of them, are under Russian control. And they've shut down communication from the plant to the outside world, and that's coming from the International Atomic Energy Agency. And now we're seeing, you know, a kind of, with disbelief, a rise in China, a connection with Russia, a geopolitical shift where we're seeing China support Russia 
in such a way that it's certainly for people, I think, that have looked at foreign policy, have traveled around the world, understand what our enemies are doing. I mean, it's very concerning. And we're also seeing that the Biden administration is continuing to make extensive foreign policy mistakes. But are they really mistakes or do they really want this to happen? What I'm saying is, do they really want to see the geopolitical shift that we are facing right now in the world? That means America will no longer be that beacon of light. America will no longer be the global leader. Why is the Biden administration pushing so hard for an Iran deal? Why? Why is the Biden administration laying the groundwork, and they did lay the groundwork, for Russia to invade Ukraine? Why? They did. I mean, every mistake that they made in Afghanistan, and I'm going to talk to Eric Greitens about this as well, because he's a former Navy SEAL. You're always a Navy SEAL. He will always have his trident, right? But he can talk to that. Look at what we did in Afghanistan. I mean, there was never, I I don't think there could be anything worse that could have been done in Afghanistan than what Biden did and the administration, how they withdrew and how they showed the world our weakness. It didn't have to be that way. They wanted it that way. I mean, they basically left so much behind as well. Not only did we lose 13 Marines and innocent civilians, we left the Taliban in charge of security all over Kabul when we didn't need to, and we left a strategic base, Bagram Airfield, which I spent a lot of time in. We just left it there for the Chinese, for the Chinese. And let me tell you what the Chinese government is doing now. They have allowed, you know, we have all these sanctions on Vladimir Putin, but now Russia is switching to Chinese credit card banking system. The Chinese are saying, look, you don't need America. Screw Visa. Screw MasterCard. Screw them. Come to us. Well, China's laundering Mexican drug money. Why not allow Vladimir Putin to be on their banking system? You've got Visa and MasterCard suspending all of their services in Russia. And they did that after Ukrainian President Volodymyr, Volodymyr, I like to say his name like that, Zelensky, had a phone call with U.S. lawmakers. You can read all about it at sarahcarter.com. The move by the credit card companies was announced on Saturday. It was announced just days after they had blocked Russian banks from access to their networks. In a statement, Visa announced that the company will cease all Visa transactions in Russia. On Sunday, Reuters reported that several Russian banks said on Sunday that they would soon start issuing, listen to this, cards using the Chinese Union Pay card operator system, couples with Russia's own mere network. That's what they're going to do. And funny enough, Russia's biggest lender, ShareBank, as well as Alpha Bank and Tinkoff, made the announcements that they were also switching to the Chinese system. Guys, I want to tell you something. Not everything is as it seems. I question everything here. I question the fact that instead of the Biden administration doing what they need to do, doing what they need to do, what do I mean? But what they need to do, they need to open up, open up federal lands for drilling. Yes, we do. Because we're still a planet run on fossil fuels. And what else do we need to do? We need to reinstigate the Keystone Pipeline again. We need to get that going. We need to get that built. We need to be energy independent, not just for now, but for our future, for the national security of our nation. But instead, what does the Biden administration do? And I want you to think about this. We have Iran, right? Promising, and I brought this up in my last podcast. You guys can hear it. Go back and listen. In fact, in the last several podcasts with Daniel Hoffman, former CIA station chief, and now a Fox News contributor, and an expert in Russia. I brought all of this up. That Iran, Iran is also looking at the long game. They have threatened people within the Trump administration. We know now that one of them was John Bolton, that they are threatening to assassinate a U.S. leader 
Why? In an attempt, in an attempt to get back for the killing and execution of Soleimani, General Soleimani with the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. And let me tell you a little bit about the IRGC. The IRGC is one of the biggest state sponsors of terrorism in the world. They work proxy wars. But guess what Biden administration is going to do? They want to lift the sanctions against the IRGC. They want to allow for a new Iran nuclear deal like they had under President Obama when Biden was vice president. And they've been wanting this. Why? Because it is a legacy issue for people like Susan Rice that are inside the White House right now, which are they're really running the country into the ground, but they're running it into the ground purposefully, I believe, into the ground. Why do they want to re revamp, redo, bring back the old Iran nuke deal, which, by the way, the sunset clauses in that and everything was a nightmare. Iran will have nuclear weapons before you know it. They do not care about us or about our nation, folks. And now they want to lift all of the, you know, uh, uh, they want to lift sanctions on Iran. They want to redo the deal. They want to remove the IRGC from the terror watch list. And we know that the Iranians want to target our nation. And they also want to buy oil from them. How about that? So instead of making us energy independent, we are still purchasing, you know, gas from Russia, right? I want you to think about this. Crude oil from Russia in 2021, in 2021, it was over 20,000 or 201,000 barrels per day of crude oil, which was at $100 a gallon right now, or now it's 125, but let's just say it's at $100 per barrel, right, per barrel, sorry, per barrel, that would be around over $20 million a day, right? That's just crude oil. That doesn't even include everything else. And now we're saying we're going to go ahead and we're going to, you know, buy it from the Iranians. When are we just going to turn over our banking system? And I want you guys to think about this to the Chinese, right? Because I'm just waiting for Biden to do that. Not only is he going to be, you know, still funding the Ukraine war, and then making all these weird decisions like to purchase from our enemies like Iran. But think about the credit card situation just for one minute. Think outside of the box, outside of the sanction box, right? What does it mean when our credit card companies can be, and our banking systems can be totally owned and just manipulated by governments to, and, and in the punishment of the people? What about the Americans that are still in Russia? What about the people that still what, can't use your credit card? Oh, my. Oh, shit. I can't use my credit card. I'm in Moscow. My credit card's not working. But think about the implications of that for us. Think about the implications of that for Amer just regular Americans. Look at what happened in Canada. What happened in Canada? Oh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. What did he do? He and his government seized bank accounts. Seized their trucks, their 18-wheelers, took away their livelihoods. Your money's not really yours, right? I want you to think about what this means in the big picture because not everything is what it seems. And that should really scare you right now. Not everything is what it seems. We have no idea where this is going. I don't want to sound hopeless. I, I have hope. I'm going to try to be positive, but we have no idea where this is going. And I want you to think about China. What is China doing? What are they planning? Are they planning on going into Taiwan? What would the world do if they went into Taiwan? What would the world do right now if Vladimir Putin decided after Ukraine to go into Lithuania? Would NATO really stand up? Would NATO really fight back? And if China invades Taiwan, would we do something about that? We didn't do anything about it when we knew that they were abusing, and they still are, 
and committing genocide against the Uyghurs. What did we do with COVID? We didn't do anything about that. I, I mean, as far as I know, China's never been really held accountable for what happened, which I believe was right out of the Wuhan lab for what they did for spreading a virus all over the world. So what's going to happen now? Are we going to do nothing with China? Because we have so many companies invested with so much money in China that it would be hard for them to make any decision on China because they don't want to give up the green. They can't move their factories here to America. There's no incentive to do it in this administration. I don't know. We're going to have to see where that goes. But remember, you know, every time something happens, when we see, we go, oh, yeah, good. You know, look at what Visa and MasterCard are doing. Look at the sanctions. We have to think of the long-term picture here, folks. Just like we have to think of the long-term picture in Ukraine, the long-term picture in China, the long-term picture here in the United States, what it means to us and what it means to the future of our children and our families. And by the way, do what I did. Turn off the news a little bit, you know, not all the time because we got to know what's going on. And just do something with your children. Do something with your families. You know, people have lost their lives. God bless the Ukrainian people who are standing up to the Russian military and to the Ru Russia's might. But a lot of people have lost their lives. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of families that wish they would have spent some more time together. We really don't know. We really don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. All we can do is hope for the best and uh, hold our lawmakers accountable. And I will be back in a moment with Eric Greitens. But first, I want to talk to you about a great deal. And I mean, this is a great deal. And it's for my good friend, Mike Lindell. And well, you can get more than 20 great deals from MyPillow.com right now. And it's MyPillow.com backslash Carter. Don't forget MyPillow.com backslash Carter. So you can access every single deal. You can get my pillows as low as 1998. You can get slippers at 50% off. You can get my pillow towel sets at their lowest price ever of $39.99. And you can get 60% off any Giza dream sheets. You will find all of these offers and more at mypillow.com backslash Carter or call 1 800 685 7221. That's mypillow.com backslash Carter. Right now, every order using promo code Carter will receive Mike's new book, What Are the Odds? From Crack Addict to CEO. You'll get that for free, for free at mypillow.com backslash Carter or call 1 800 685 7221. Get direct access to deals at MyPillow.com backslash Carter. And now I'm bringing on former Missouri Governor Eric Greitens. He is now running for the Republican nomination of the U.S. Senate in Missouri. This is an open seat, guys. As Republican Roy Blunt is retiring, there's a bunch of folks running for this seat, a bunch of folks fighting over this seat. Governor Greitens also served as a U.S. Navy SEAL. He's traveled the world and was deployed to Afghanistan four times. First of all, I want to say thank you so much, um, Eric, for joining me on the show. You are now running for the U.S. Senate in Missouri. You are definitely taking the lead. And I brought you here because I want to talk about an array of topics, all the way from what you've dealt with in the past with law enforcement uh, to your current run and Mitch McConnell. So thank you so much for being here on The Sarah Carter Show. It's great to be here on The Sarah Carter Show. Thanks for having me. It'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> Oh, it is going to be a lot of fun. It is going to be a lot of fun. First, we're going to get down and dirty, though. We're going to talk about the past. Yes. And I'm talking about William yes. Don, William Don Tisby. And he, he's returning um, to St. Louis for trial on um, March 28th. Um, here is a man, a former FBI agent who was chosen by St. Louis's top prosecutor to investigate you. And he was caught lying multiple times. Um, and tampering with evidence. Uh, let's start with that and let's talk about how that affected you and, and let's talk about how that affects us as citizens when law enforcement officials and lawyers uh, target uh, regular citizens at the time you were the governor um, and what they did to your life. Yeah, well, look, 
everyone who's listening right now or, or watching us has seen the way that the left has tried to weaponize the law. They have, and in the process, they're really destroying the rule of law. In this case, what you had is you had, as you said, a former FBI agent, William Tisby, who was hired by a George Soros funded prosecutor. Now, the left always gets crazy when we talk about George Soros, but let's be clear Kim Gardner, that's Kim Gardner. She was a George, is a George Soros funded prosecutor. And when I say that, John Solomon's actually done the research, he's got the receipts in her race. The vast majority of her funding, I think it was 68 to 73 percent of her funding, came from one super PAC. That PAC had one funder. It was George Soros. So Soros puts this uh, prosecutor in office, Kim Gardner. And what happened was when I was governor in 2017, all of your listeners will remember that Missouri, before I had been governor, back in Ferguson, was the home of the anti-police movement in America. That happened before I was governor. I came in as governor talking about how we are not going to allow looting. We're not going to allow burning. And when I was governor in 2017, <clears throat> we had a case. It was called the Stockley case, where there was a police officer who had shot and killed a black man on duty. He was sent to trial. And we had, as the verdict was coming out, we had Black Lives Matter and Antifa activists from all over the country flood Missouri, and they promised. They said, we are going to burn Missouri down. They said it will be so bad, you won't even remember Ferguson. Um, I believe that if you lead with compassion and clarity and courage, you can find ways to protect people while also protecting their constitutional rights. So what happened, big picture story, was that I went out. And I talked with all of the pastors, all of the black churches who I had been working with for a long time before this incident. I went out with the fiance of the man who was shot. I put my arm around her the night before the verdict came out. And I said, no matter what happens tomorrow, there are going to be people who are upset by the verdict. I said, and as a Navy SEAL, I fought for everyone's constitutional rights. That means that you have the constitutional right to freedom of speech. You have the constitutional right to freedom of assembly. And I said, anyone who is out peacefully exercising those rights is going to find the police are out there protecting. But I also said, let's be clear, throwing a brick through a window is not free speech. If you arrest, if you, if you uh, throw a brick at a law enforcement officer, you're going to be arrested. And whereas the previous governor had literally said he wanted to give people safe spaces to loot and to burn, I said, if you loot and you burn, the only safe space you're going to have is in a jail cell. And long story short, with what I hope was that compassion and that clarity and the courage of our law enforcement officers and community leaders on the front lines, we put an end to BLM and Antifa. And after three days, they left Missouri. They'd overturned some potted plants and they'd broken some windows. That's pretty impressive. Well, thank you. It was, it was all due to, to, to the courage and the tenacity of people on the front lines. And I was honored to support all of those officers, have their backs. They could do their job. And, you know, they, they tried. The very last night, the third night, they said, we're going to bring in, and they did. They brought in hundreds of activists from around the country, and they literally said, Brighton's can't arrest all of us. And we brought up the prison buses from Southeast Missouri, and we said, in fact, like if you're throwing bricks through windows, you're gonna you're gonna get arrested. So so what happened though is that we proved that you could defeat BLM. We proved that you could defeat Antifa. We proved that you could protect people's constitutional rights and at the same time not allow looting and burning. And we know now, right after that, the George Soros funded prosecutor started a false case against me. She literally started the paperwork to charge me with a crime. I was a target. I was a target because we'd proven, I'd proven that we could defeat them. Let me explain this really quick to, our, to the listeners out here that are listening to you right now. When you say, you know, it's not a conspiracy theory, George Soros is funding, um, you know, these district attorneys, he is. All you have to do is go, and this is so, for all of you out there listening, um, go to the Los Angeles Times. Go to the Washington Post. Look at the different stories. Go to the Boston Globe. Look at the different stories out there. Here, here's one from the LA Times. Here's why George Soros, 
liberal groups are spending big to help decide who's your next district attorney. And this was from 2018. He has literally gone in. We saw it in Loudoun County in Virginia. We've seen it everywhere. He's had a a massive effort, this billionaire with tons of NGOs and tons of money and, and private funders to affect law, to affect our local our local um, communities, our, our states, through the legal system. And it's been actually kind of a brilliant uh, plan on Soros's part because once he affects the inner workings of our communities, he affects the whole country straight up and, and targets, targets you, targets anyone he wants. Explain that a little That's bit. That's exactly right. So he takes over... He takes over these prosecutors' offices. And keep in mind, this is a leftist tactic. It has always been a leftist tactic. Joseph Stalin's head of the secret police said this. He said, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. And what he meant by that was anyone who the left wanted to take out, they would literally point at them And then they create a false case against them. And that's one of the tactics. It was used by Stalin. It was used by Mao in China. It was used by Pol Pot in Cambodia. Anywhere you see a leftist movement, they use this tactic. And this is what Kim Gardner, the Soros-funded prosecutor, did against me. And she literally knew that she wanted to charge me with the crime. And they've discovered now that she started her paperwork in the fall after we defeated BLM and Antifa. And then what she did was that knowing that she couldn't get St. Louis police officers to do her work, knowing that she couldn't get her own investigators to create a false case, she hires a former FBI agent named William Tisby for one express purpose, to create a false case against me. And in the contract, she says, that he will report only to her and only verbally, right? Now, now who does that? Everybody knows that if, there, if there's any kind of investigation, you take notes, you look for evidence, you interview people. So it's a complete setup. Oh, he, his, lies were, his lies were incredible. I mean, he, during, during his deposition, I mean, he couldn't even answer any questions uh, straight. In fact, he kept changing his answers. He sounded a lot like a high school student that was caught drinking in the gym and was trying to come up with like some kind of answer, right? It was crazy. It was totally. that obvious. It, it, was, it was so obvious. And in fact, just to point to some specific lies, right? He claimed that he never took any notes. Now you ask yourself, well, why would someone make a claim that he never took any notes? Again, And his lie was, he said he was an FBI agent. He said he sat and he listened to someone for hours without taking a single note. And then his memory was perfect. And he was able verbatim to remember exactly what they said and put it down. That was the lie. Now, why did he lie like that? He lied like that because, in fact, the George Soros-fonded prosecutor had handed him six pages of typed up notes that she wanted him to use to create a false case. And what he did was he, in fact, wrote his notes on top of the Soros-funded prosecutor's notes. This is just one of the things that he was found guilty of, the perjury lying about these notes. Now, it's almost comic now seeing like how absurd this was. But at the time, at the time what happened was that you had this Soros-funded prosecutor and you had all of the leftist media and you had a former FBI agent, who people trust, creating this false case, terrible accusations about me. It was awful for me. It was awful for my family. It was awful for everybody who worked for us. And what they do, keep in mind also, this is a leftist tactic. They're using it right now with the January 6th committee. When they attack you, right. they're attacking you with government money. But you have to pay as an individual to defend yourself. So it's unlimited pockets. Unlimited pockets. Unlimited pockets where they, where they attack you. Now, to, to, to fast forward, here's the good news. 
at least in my case, at least in this case, what's happened is that William Tisby was indicted and he's been charged with seven felonies, six felony counts of perjury, another felony count of evidence tampering, all for creating a false case against me. And he's going to go to trial at the end of March. If he goes to prison, which I hope that he will and expect that he will, he'll be the first person who goes to prison for trying to overturn the results of the 2016 election. That's incredible. Okay, that moves me to what you're doing right now, because, I mean, there's so much going on. You are a former, uh, well, I don't even like to say former. You'll always be a SEAL, right? (laughs) You'll always be a U.S. Navy SEAL. Um, And I wanted to get... So, so I wanted to get I wanted to get your take on what you're seeing right now, the reason why you're running for the Senate. And I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing I'm not 100 percent certain, but what you've seen happen overseas in Afghanistan and other issues may have led you back into politics, because, I mean, it takes a lot to go back into politics after all you've been through. Thank you. Well, you know what? I, I, I will also say, Sarah, and, and for, for all of your for all of your listeners, you know, the truth does eventually come. And Sarah, you've been fighting it. You're one of the most courageous journalists in the country. And everybody sees there's this big wave of lies that comes. And when it comes, when you're in that wave, it is incredibly powerful. But eventually, that big wave of lies does crash on the rock of the facts. And we have to, we have to hold on. We have to be courageous. We have to continue to fight for the truth. And yes, in this case, not only is Tisby uh, going to be going to prison. The uh, the Soros-funded prosecutor, the good news, she might be the first Soros-funded prosecutor to lose her law license. The Office of the Chief Disciplinary Counsel found her guilty of over 70 false statements when she created a false case against me. The journalist who paid people $120,000 in cash bribes to lie about me, that's all coming out. And, and I was, we, we were completely exonerated. But, but, but one thing that that has done for me, Sarah, is that it has absolutely prepared me. I'm so grateful for everything that I lived through because the pain that you get, the suffering that you get on the other side, there is wisdom and there is strength. And part of the wisdom is that now I have no illusions about the nature of the enemy. We are facing some real evil. And that wasn't a word that I used when I was running in 2015, 2016. This is real evil. When Soros-funded prosecutors allow murderers back onto the street, when people knowingly take kids with disabilities and force them to stay out of school for a year, when Joe Biden enables the largest human trafficking operation in the world at our southern border, this is cruel and it is evil and it has to be fought. It truly is evil. Do you think it's an attempt to break our nation? It's so obvious. Yes. Yes. I think that anyone who takes a breath and looks at this rationally has to recognize that the left is actively trying to destroy the country. And you look at at issue after issue. Uh, You know, you, you asked about being overseas, right? Obviously, I flew in and out of Bagram Air Base when I served um, in Afghanistan. And after the military disaster in Afghanistan, people kept coming up to me and they're like, can you explain to us what they were thinking? And the short answer is no, like absolutely not. Like you could have pulled a group of fifth graders together and they could have organized a better evacuation. Everybody knows you keep your strategic air base. Everybody knows you get your civilians out first. Everybody knows you either get out or destroy your military equipment. And what they did there only benefited Russia, China, and the Taliban. And it wasn't just there. You look at all of their policies. You look at the vaccine mandate, or just in my community, in the Navy SEAL community, you've got 600 to 700 guys who are saying they don't want to take the vaccine. And the Biden administration is threatening to pull their trident, their Navy SEAL trident, so that they can no longer serve as Navy SEALs. You do that, you, you're eliminating the combat power of one of our nation's premier special operations forces. Again, who does that benefit? It benefits Russia. It benefits China. It benefits the Taliban. And there is no military, scientific, or medical rationale for it. 
You look at them opening the border. You look at defunding the police. All of that's just to say, yes, Sarah, I have come to the conclusion that we are facing real evil, that it has to be fought, and and we also have to recognize rhinos aren't going to save us. Not only does the left come with their craziness and their attacks on the country, but unfortunately, too much Republican corruption and cowardice has enabled the left to do that. So we need to stand up and we need to fight for our country. I absolutely agree with you on that. And I think that running for office is a way to do that. You're running for the Senate. What are the issues um, and what's the main message at the center of your campaign? Yeah, so, so the main message is people know that I am a fighter. They know that I served, uh, served our country as a Navy SEAL. They know that after my team was hit by a suicide truck bomb, when I came home, I fought for my fellow veterans, make sure that they could continue to lead, lead productive and meaningful lives here at home. They know that I fought for them as governor. And they see that I'm the only one who's willing to take on both the left and also their allies in the mainstream media and in the Republican establishment. And look, when people look in Missouri, very similar issues to what they're seeing around the country. People are deeply concerned over the border. And we can talk about, I've been down to the border and I didn't just go to the American side of the border. I went to the Mexican side of the border to expose what was really happening there. But, but you know, the border is a big issue. Law and order, the horrific rise in murders and violent crime around the country is a big issue. COVID tyranny is a big issue. The economy and inflation are all big issues. And the defining issue in this race is just that people recognize that I'm the fighter. We have tremendous support from so many of President Trump's allies because they've seen that I've been willing to stand up and do what needs to be done to protect the people of Missouri. Let me ask you this. I want to go back to what you said about Afghanistan. Um, you know, my husband, he's a special operator as well, was retired. He's retired Delta. And he, um, like you, saw what happened in Afghanistan. Do you think that failure, that failed withdrawal from Afghanistan on the part of the Biden administration um, put, I guess, maybe sent a message to our enemies in the world that this is the time to move against America. We're seeing this in Ukraine right now, given your military experience. Um, what do you think is going to happen from here? Because I know a lot of Americans are deeply, deeply concerned that we're somehow going to get dragged into a possibility of a third world war or that our enemies right now are just chomping at the bit to take this nation down. Yeah, you are absolutely, absolutely right, Sarah. Look, Joe Biden's senility and incompetence are an invitation to our enemies. And it's both what they saw in Afghanistan and also the way Biden has been attacking us here at home. Keep in mind, on the very first day, the very first day that Joe Biden came into office, what did he do? He killed the Keystone XL pipeline. Now think about what, what that means strategically. You know, when I was serving in, in, in Iraq in 06, 07, if somebody had said that the United States was going to be the largest energy producer in the world, it would have seemed like a dream. But in fact, President Trump got us there. And that helped to make America stronger. Joe Biden came into office. He kills the Keystone XL pipeline. And what you saw big picture, and it's important for everybody to understand, was a great contrast between President Trump's peace through strength foreign policy and Joe Biden's policy of chaos and weakness. All right. So, so what did Trump do? Trump comes in and he says, and he says rightly, we're going to put an end to endless wars. He also says we're going to act with strength where necessary. So what did he do? He moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. He recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. He defeated ISIS. He killed the Iranian butcher, Qasem Soleimani. He took that action. And what were the fruits of that action? You had historic peace deals. The last time Israel had, had normalized relations with one of its Arab neighbors was 1994 in Jordan, and before that's 1979 in Egypt. And Trump got all of those peace deals done. By contrast, Joe Biden comes in and everyone sees his weakness. They see his incompetence. They see the attacks against America. And most viscerally, they watch this completely botched, terrible, terrible 
withdrawal from Afghanistan. And, you know, I'll say just down the road here, Jared Schmitz was one of the 13 United States Marines uh, who gave his life for this country because of Joe Biden's incompetence, has terrible, terrible consequences. And now, of course, Russia watched this and China watched it. All of the allies saw it. So you've got a new military cooperation agreement between Russia and Saudi Arabia. You have Russia moving into the Ukraine. You have China sending nuclear capable aircraft through Taiwanese airspace. It is always the case that when you have a new president, people look to see whether or not they're strong. Keep in mind, you know, John Kennedy, when he was in office, had the failure at the Bay of Pigs. What happened? Russia thought he was weak. So then everything started moving towards the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Kennedy stood up there. He was strong and they were able to avert it. But this is a pattern that happens with every new president. And the fact is, Joe Biden has failed. People see him as senile. They see him as weak. They see him as incompetent. And now they're moving against us. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think like you brought up a very good point. I, and that's the Abraham Accords. I mean, what we saw under the Trump administration with Jared Kushner and others who worked on the Abraham Accords and made that piece possible. It's almost as if we're unraveling the yarn of what we created. I mean, it's just it's incredible how this under the Biden administration in the last year, we have gone from leading in the world, America first to a world that's literally on the edge, um, a nuclear ready Russia. I mean, it's just absolutely yeah. stunning. I want to talk to you a little bit about President Trump. You know, when he puts his support behind someone, that's a big deal. How important is the support from President Trump in your race in Missouri? Because he's looking, he's leaning your way. Yes. Well, obviously, we would be honored to have President Trump's uh, uh, formal endorsement. Absolutely. He has uh, tremendous, tremendous support here uh, in, the, in the state of Missouri. And, and we'd obviously love for him to come at some point to, to do a rally uh, here in Missouri as well. Now, I always, out of tremendous respect for the president team, I always keep any conversations that I or my team have with the president or his team, we keep those confidential because, you know, his uh, decision about uh, how and when to endorse is, is for him and, and his team to make. I will say, we're honored already to have the support of so many of his fighters. So Kimberly Guilfoyle is our national chair. Mm -hmm. We've got Rudy Giuliani on the team and Seb Gorka on the team and Dennis Prager on the team. And we've been endorsed by veterans for Trump, by women for Trump, by black voices for Trump, by Hispanics for Trump, by Jewish Americans for Trump, by fighters for Trump. They've all come and, and supported this campaign. And it's why when we're out, we have hundreds of people who come out to, to our rallies. And it's really, really powerful to see the people of Missouri stand up and, and fight, for their, uh, fight for their country. I think that's really great. Yeah, and of course, I saw Kimberly Guilfoy came out and, and you have so much support all the way around and you are, you are ahead in the polls. You are ahead in the polls. I mean, that's very, very important right now. And I think part of that has to do with you not being afraid to take on, you know, the big boys in Washington, the swamp is what I'm talking about. And that, well, part of that is Mitch McConnell. We're talking about Mitch McConnell, right? You've said it. You've come yes. out. He should no longer be the Republican leader in the Senate. You've said this. Um, do you think yes. that's going to affect anything either way? Well, look, uh, the fact is, and, and this is, we had a lot of political advisors who was like, look, you're ahead. Don't, you know, stir the, stir the nest. Don't, you know, uh, do this. And I said, look, guys, everybody recognizes that the Republican Party on so many issues has failed the people of the United States of America and they failed the people of Missouri. Too often, rhinos in the political establishment haven't done what they needed to do. They needed to stand up around election integrity. In Missouri, when people watch Republicans who refused to help President Trump build a border wall, but instead they watch those Republicans sign on to the Green New Deal, they say, this, this is wrong, right? And the fact is, we need to have America first leadership in the United States Senate. So yes, I was the first candidate in the country to come out and say that when I'm in the Senate, we're voting for new America first leadership, and I'm voting against Mitch McConnell. What does that mean? It means that the political establishment and all of their allies in the mainstream media come after us, but we're going to win. 
So there's there's two things here. It's getting new leadership, of course, in the Senate, new Republican leadership, but it's also gaining control of the Senate next year, getting the Republican yes. Party back in control of the Senate. What? And I'm going to make this the last question because I think this is very important. What is at stake when it comes to which party is controlling the Senate next year? How serious of an issue is this? Our, our country is at stake. That's how serious it is. We have to take back the Senate. We have to take back the House because we have to at least put a break on the incredible destruction that Biden and the left is doing to this country. It is absolutely critical. You look at the insane damage that they've done in just over one year. We have to put an end to this so that we have a chance to revive. And right now, and I'll just end by saying, I think we're at a critical moment in our country. And there's only two paths that we're going to go down. One is that we're going to surrender to the cruelty and evil and tyranny of the left. I'm not going to do that. I know that you're not going to do that. I know that your listeners aren't going to do that. That's one path. The, the other path is that we take all of this pressure, we take everything that the left has done against the country. And in a resilient country, what we do is that we use all of that for a great revival, that we find a way to revive the republic, to revive people's sense of citizenship, that we go back and we take back not just the House and the Senate, but we take back school boards and we take back our counties and we take back our government and we take back our lives. That's what we can do. And that's what's at stake right now in my entire life. I was in SEAL team training when 9-11 happened. I've served in Iraq and Afghanistan, Southeast Asia, the Horn of Africa in my entire life. No moment has been more important than this moment right now. And that's why we all have to step in, find a way to help take our country back. Eric, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Dr. Mike Fulgens, he's America's gold expert. And guess what? He's the 2021 numismatic dealer of the year. He is predicting that silver prices will continue to rise as inflation and industrial use follow their upward trends. And you know what that means, guys, more inflation, especially in this administration. And I think that's why he and his company, Universal Coin and Bullion, are now offering a 2022 genuine one ounce silver American Eagle coin at just $28 with free shipping to you. Everyone should own a percentage of precious metals. So call Universal Coin and Bullion today at 1 800 UCB Gold. You will not regret this. Be sure to mention me by name when you call. That's 1 800 UCB Gold to get a tangible asset that you can hold in your hand. Call Universal Coin and Bullion at 1 800 UCB Gold, and their expert team of representatives will help you order your $28 American Silver Eagle coin today. That's 1 800 UCB Gold. Don't forget to tell them Sarah sent you. Before we close off the show today, I want to talk a little bit about gas prices. Yes, everything has gone up, but I don't think anything's as noticeable as the gas prices. And it is extraordinary. Some parts of the country, like in California, it's over $7 a barrel. I'm going to be heading out there to talk to people about this uh, for Fox News. And I, I mean, it's when I was there just several weeks ago, I was already paying $5.99 a gallon of gas. I had a rental car. I was going to meet with the truckers. I mean, and I really drove. I mean, I, I could not believe how expensive it was. And can you imagine for all of us, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, I mean, that is a huge amount of money. And for those who are elitists, so those people out there who think that, you know what, it's a sacrifice that everyone has to make. No, this is Joe Biden's problem. Don't let these elitists guilt you into thinking that this is your responsibility to shoulder the burden for the Ukrainians. That's absolute bullshit. He could open up federal lands for drilling. We could be number one. If he would have just kept the plan in place that President Trump had, we would not have this problem. But they don't want to do that. And, and this green, this all, all this talk about going green, we're not even close to going green yet. We are run by fossil fuels. That is our world today. So we have to do what's best 
for our people and move. I'm not saying we don't want to do what's best for our environment. I'm not saying that at all. But we have to have common sense. And there is no common sense left. I want you to first listen to this. This is Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. And by the way, he is just so off his rocker. I mean, he, he really believes that if you, you and me, want to save money on gas, we just need to go out and buy an electric vehicle. Like we've got $65,000, $126,000, or $75,000 to blow on that. And by the way, where are these electric filling stations? Listen to this. Last month, we announced a $5 billion investment to build out a nationwide electric vehicle charging network so the people from rural to suburban to urban communities can all benefit from the gas savings of driving an EV. Is he serious? Is he really serious? I mean, because we don't have it out there, guys. It does not exist. Even if you put all the money towards that, it's not going to happen tomorrow. And by the way, I don't have 120 something thousand dollars or $75,000 to spend on an electric vehicle right now. Gas is over $4 per gallon in many parts of the country right now. In some parts, it's a lot more than that. I want you to listen to this. Biden won't boost domestic production. He won't. Instead, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm makes it clear that they are moving ahead with their effort to kill fossil fuels. Listen. We're working through an energy transition, and we've got to start by adding energy. And the reality is we have to take some time to get off of oil and gas. We recognize this. This is a transition. They are just so full of it. The only people benefiting from this, certainly not the American people, certainly not our nation, um, you know, are the Russians um, and the Iranians and everybody else in the world are benefiting from Biden's decision. And, you know, it used to be that I would think like, oh, they're just, you know, they're idiots. Look at what they're doing. They've got to be idiots. They got to be surrounded by idiots. But you know what? I don't believe that anymore. They know the truth. So the next question has to be, so why are they doing this? I truly believe they are trying to break our nation. Nobody could be that stupid. Nobody could be that stupid. Remember what Eric Greiden said? Even with Afghanistan, fifth graders could have done a better job at withdrawing from Afghanistan than the Biden administration did. And the, the people in the Biden administration have been around for a long time. So you tell me what they're doing. They know exactly what's going on. here, And we're the ones paying the price for it. Guys, 2022, November, can't come soon enough. 2024, can't come soon enough. I do have hope that we can make a difference. But we have to keep our eyes on the prize. We have to continually contact our lawmakers. We have to tell the truth. We can't be afraid of standing up for what's real, for what's truth. We can't allow people to censor us and ostracize us. And we have to call out their lies. We have to call out their lies. That's up to each and every one of us. I will continue to do that. I know you'll continue to do that. I want to thank Eric Greitens again for being on the Sarah Carter show today. Remember guys, you go to my website, sarahacarter.com. While you're there, you can sign up for my email list and you can download this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for being a part of the show today. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Again, God bless our great nation. God bless our world for a matter of fact, and God bless the great state of Texas. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit danaradio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.